Hi there folks, welcome back to the IB and Andy Fishing channel. I hope you're doing really well. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you want to hit the subscribe button while you're here, that'd be really useful. That way you'll be kept in touch with all the reviews, all the fishing and all the other cool stuff that IB and I have going on in the near future. Please go ahead and do that if you're a regular subscriber. It's good to see you back again. Thank you very much for joining us. Now generally on these Friday vlogs, we try and go out and do some fishing, show you guys what IB and I are up to on the riverbank, try and catch a few fish, have a contest or something like that. Unfortunately, we are getting to that time of year now where stuff like that's going to be a little bit less reliable and actually the weather so far this week has been horrendous. Uh, not only with the strong winds we've had, but also quite a lot of rain, the rivers have come up and obviously we can't take the camera kit out if it's raining really heavily. So there are going to be some times over the next few months where unfortunately we can't get out and do the fishing in the week that we'd like to. What that does mean is that we can look at stuff like we're going to do today and you've probably guessed from the title of this vlog, we're going to have a look at the rigs that I use for most of the winter for my grading fishing. And in truth, this is nice and simple because there's only two rods. I have a slightly unique situation up here in that some of the rivers I fish, we are allowed to wade. And some of the rivers I fish up here, we're not allowed to wade. So each of these rigs is for a slightly different purpose, but they're both the rigs that I use for fishing for grayling during the winter months. So I hope during the process of this, there's going to be something here that's going to be useful for you. Now the first rig I'm going to go through is the controversial one. I don't want to turn this into a slanging match in the comment section about whether it is or isn't fly fishing. I know some people hate indicators, some people really like indicators. Whatever your opinions on indicator fishing are, please go easy in the comment section. You know, fish how you want to fish. This is how some people like to fish. Some people don't like to fish like that. It's absolutely fine. But this indicator system is something that I've been working on uh, for ages actually. This, this has been an ongoing process for a long time. Now I remember when I first started getting into more modern infant styles. I actually started with a buoyant indicator. We're talking, oh crikey, I'd have been 16, 17 years old when I really started looking at grayling as a, as, a, as a proper fish to go out and fish a whole day for. And we were a little bit limited at that point in terms of what we could use. We're talking, crikey, we're talking nearly 20 years ago, that's frightening. Um, and all I could find on the market at that point was stuff like this stick on strike indicators. So that's what I'd do. I'd go out with my normal trout fishing kit, which at that point would have been an eight foot, probably a four or five weight. I'd use a tapered leader. I'd pinch on a couple of those indicators and fish a couple of flies underneath there. And for quite a long time, that was how I fished for grayling during the winter. That was all we had. Uh, it was always a pain because uh, anyone who's used these kind of pinch on style indicators will know that they're not particularly adjustable. Uh, one, one on its own isn't particularly buoyant, which is why I ended up using two. And to, with them being single use, they're environmentally not ideal. You know, I, I find I was getting through sometimes 10 a day. And that's not particularly cool. That doesn't really fit in with how I want to do my fishing. So I bin those off. A about the time, actually, that I started using more modern European style techniques. I was in New Zealand when I was 21, 22, and, and had a little play around with kind of their New Zealand systems with the walls and stuff like that. Use that a little bit. To be honest, when I came back, it was all full steam ahead, European style limping. And in truth, like a lot of people, I kind of left the idea of indicator fishing. It just wasn't a thing for me. I think mostly because all the rivers I was fishing at that point, I was able to wade. So I could use the European style techniques in those. Now, obviously in the last six, seven years, I've been spending a lot more time on the Derbyshire Wye, uh, a river that we're not allowed to wade on the Peacock Fly Fishing Club waters. A phenomenal grayling fishery, but you're not allowed to put your feet in it, which makes your own infant pretty difficult. So I ended up having to go back a few years and thinking to myself, well, how can I present properly to these fish? And for the first few months, I tried to do it just with a duo rig or a trio rig with a, a nice buoyant clink hammer and then a couple of nymphs underneath it. And it became obvious quite quickly that um, the weight that that fly needed to carry was often going to be too much for the fly. Some of these pools are six foot deep. You know, you need some serious tungsten to get down there. Uh, the other issue I had is that obviously once a indicator clink hammer or something like that gets wet, it's actually pretty hard to drag it back. And I find I was having to go through three or four different flies and then dry them out overnight. And it, to be honest, it just got a little bit high maintenance. It's also harder to adjust a duo or a trio rig when you're using a fly. I know there are some systems that, that make it a little bit more adjustable, but actually even that became a pain. And more than anything, I wasn't catching any fish on the dry fly. So I looked at it, I was like, well, if I'm not catching fish on that dry fly and it has these other drawbacks, why am I doing it? It's ridiculous. So I did away with that and my mind reverted back to New Zealand and using the wool. And for probably two years, 
I went down that route. I started off using the New Zealand indicator wall. I'll be honest, I didn't find it particularly buoyant. I found it very high maintenance. I think people forget that the guys in New Zealand fish slightly differently. They might only make 30, 40 casts a day with that indicator system, whereas the UK grayling anglers doing this for freaking, you know, six hours. And it's a very, very different style of fishing. Uh, possibly the flies we use might be slightly heavier. And I found after a while that wasn't working. So I switched to strike out, which for a while I was relatively happy with because it was the best thing I'd got to at that point. Uh, strikeout's more buoyant than the indicator will definitely 100%. Moderately adjustable, you know, you can move it up and down uh, using the same indicator tubing system. In fact, I've got one made up just there. So you can move that up and down the line to a certain extent. Relatively buoyant, it's pretty good. Hold up a couple of two and a half mil, couple of three mil beads uh, for a period of time. Obviously once, once it's gone under, you've then got to get it totally dry, dress it and stuff like that. But I was reasonably happy with that, but I had a couple of days where it was damp and humid and muggy and you know, a bit of rain in the air and I just couldn't get that thing dry. Now, I, you know, I was going through five or six different pieces of the indicator fluff in a day. It drove me bonkers. And it got to the point where I just said, no more, I've got to find another system here. And I was racking my brains, trying to think of something that I could use. And I thought right the way back to those original pinch on indicators. And actually, I was like, actually, they were very lightweight. They were hugely buoyant. They were massively visible. The only issue I had with them, or issues, sorry, were, first off, they weren't adjustable because once you'd stuck them on, they were pretty much stuck where they were. And secondly, they were single use, not particularly reusable. And I was like, well, if I can overcome those issues, then actually, I think they're pretty good. I like those. I had a little play with fish pimps and the airlocks. I found them both way too heavy on the landing. Uh, airlocks particularly, and actually not as buoyant as I thought they might be. The air, I find that airlock couldn't hold up a four and a half mil bead, which I use a lot of. So that was a real issue. Fish pimp, it, it lands so hard. It lands really, really hard. Again, I kind of, I, I ditched that within two sessions, to be honest, that was gone. So it was rack my brain's time really to figure out a way of using these foam indicators but on a different system. And that's what I'm going to talk about is my indicate system that I've come up with. As I say, it's not gonna to be to everyone's taste. There's a couple of ingredients here that people might not like, but I'll go through that rig now, step by step, and explain why the stuff that's in it is in there. So first things first, the rods. And the good news is, is that the rods that I use for my grayling indicator fishing in the winter are the same rods I use for my trout dry fly fishing in the summer. So that's a 10 foot four weight, nice moderate action. It's not fast in the slightest. It's a 10 foot four weight. Uh, again, just as I did with the dry fly rigs, I've actually overlined it. There's a five weight line on there. We're not casting particularly long distances. And because we're throwing nymphs and what's gonna be quite a bulky indicator once we get to that point, the extra mass of a five weight line actually carries it all in the air a little bit better. I know again, there'll be arguments about overlining and you shouldn't do it. There are situations where I think it's the right thing to do and this is definitely one of them. So it's a five weight line on a four weight rod. It's a floating line, obviously, down to which I've attached a nine foot 020 mil taper leader. Pretty straightforward so far, everyone will have seen those. I don't like them for dry fly fishing, actually for indicator fishing in the winter, not an issue at all. So there's an 020 mil taper leader on there. I cut off the thinnest, kind of 18 inches of that. Nearly all of the level section at the end are cut off. because we don't need it. That's, that's the piece that you would normally attach a fly onto. Uh, we lose energy transfer in that level section. Onto the taper leader there, I'm then gonna attach a section of around about one meter to one and a half meters of six pound tippet. This is 0214 mil fluorocarbon. It's pretty much the same diameter as the taper leader. So we're gonna attach about a meter of that, excuse teeth. Yeah, about that much. And that would end up being our adjustable section. This is the section of this, in, of this leader where we're gonna be able to adjust the depth of our indicator. So that goes on there. The next thing that's gonna go on there, and this is where it gets a little bit weird, folks, I'm afraid, is a course angler's float stop. Now, I know what you're all thinking straight away, that's not a fly fishing product. You're absolutely right, it's not. This has come from a different code of fly fishing. But in order to get the adjustability from this rig that I want, these things are absolutely crucial. I have massively geeked out on float stops in the last few months. And the best ones I've found are these, the Guru line stops, super tight in the small. It's important though in the small. They are the absolute best I've found. Uh, there's some really bad ones out there actually, but these are very, very good. There's no weight to them. They work just how a normal line stop does. You pass your line through the little wire loop, pull them on, and they're fixed on there for as long as you want. Uh, not expensive. They are the right product for the job when it comes to this rig. So one of those goes on there. And then this next bit is where it gets a little bit interesting. So we'll all have seen, at the very least, would have seen in the fly shops, 
these strike indicators. These are the fully mill ones, the nice bright colours. There are plenty of others available. I've found these have been pretty good. So they come on a card and you push one out of the card and you end up with this little kind of figure of eight shape just there. That's one of those strike indicators. So I've, got, I'm, I've popped one of those out of there. I'm going to put that to one side just for the moment. The next ingredient in this is a hook and actually a barbed hook. This is a relatively long shank hook. To be honest, any shape, any shape hook will work. I'm finding the longer the shank, the better it grips the uh, indicator. So I'm going to take the backing off this pinch on indicator. A little bit of paper just peels off. And I'm going to line up the hook so that the eye just sticks out of one end. A little bit fiddly, these. Sometimes takes one or two goes. And they're very, very sticky. If that hook is in there, I've actually buried it past the barb into the foam. So that's one part of that done. You're probably already getting a feel for where this is going. I'm going to get one of the yellow ones, unpeel the paper off the back of that. I'm going to stick that very firmly and totally level with the other one, which will encase the hook at this point. The hook is now totally encased in that foam. And that'll look something like that. So there we go. That is now a pretty significant bicolored foam nugget just with the eye of the hook sticking out at the very top. It's important there isn't too much sticking out there. You want to bury that eye as close as you can to the end of the foam. I'm then going to slide that on to the fluorocarbon onto which I've just put that float stop. So we're going to slide that on and then we're going to put another float stop onto that same piece and that will hold that in place. And because we've used float stops, you can now slide that and that's going to be really adjustable. What you can do with this is you can build on it further. So I'm just going to pick up this one I've got here for a second. So this one, not only have I got the two pieces on, but I've also put one other piece either side to make it particularly buoyant. That's a really buoyant one. So this is my kind of moderate rig. This one, the big daddy, but that has two on either side. That is incredibly buoyant. And that's great for throwing. In fact, what have we got on there at the moment? Yeah, there you go. That's got a four and a half mil bead and a three mil bead and it holds that up absolutely fine, incredibly buoyant. But obviously the beauty of this system is how easy it is to adjust. So I'm just going to unpin this one for a second. So we've got those two float stops there and you can see if I want to make this deeper, all I do is slide them along and I've just made that in that system about a foot deeper in a matter of seconds. It's not added any weight particularly, it's all very buoyant, it's all very adjustable, I'm going to be able to see the indicator but those two flies are now fishing a foot deeper than they were before. So it's an incredibly adjustable system. As I say, there are going to be people watching this who are just horrified by the thought of using these indicators. They work. It's really buoyant. It catches fish. And do you know what? Particularly in the winter, it's not something I use in the summer, but particularly in the winter, it, you know, it's minus two. It's freezing cold. Those fish are right on the deck. You just want to catch a freaking fish. I'm much more inclined to say to people, just do what you need to. If you, know, if you want to fish an indicator, do that. If you want to fish a French, you do that. There are guys who go out trying for maggots. If, you're, if you've got it in you to go fishing in the winter for these grayling, you catch them however you want because you'll earn every single one of them. Okay, so down from there, you could use a tippet ring at this point. I've blood knotted it. You could use a tippet ring at this point. I've joined that six pound adjustable section to some 5X with a blood knot. And then there's probably 18 inches to a tippet ring. Nice short dropper there, about three or four inches, and it's probably a foot in total to the point fly there. So both those flies are going to be within 30 centimetres of the riverbed. Obviously, this is adjustable. You could change this. If you were that way inclined, you could even add another tippet ring and fish a third fly. I must admit, I do find it gets a little bit tangly once you add the third fly. Two is absolutely fine for where we fish, but if you're fishing somewhere particularly deep, by all means, add a third fly, and then you can fish three, kind of check style, but underneath the indicator. So this piece is 5X. Both the flies are on 6x droppers. Now, it's conceivable there, we could go lighter, we could go 6x, 7x. The reason I don't is that we fish on the Derbyshire Y. Not only have we got some really big grail in there, we've also got a huge quantity of very big trout. And I just know if I fish 7x for any amount of time, eventually we're going to start getting break-offs. It's not cool on the fish. You know, we want to land these fish. Some of these grayling go up to three pounds. We want to make sure we get them in the net. The nice thing about an indicator system is because the flies generally land and free fall is you can get away with slightly lighter flies, which means that we don't have to fish the real, real heavy stuff all the time. And that O2 mil adjustable section is thin enough that even with, there's a three mil bead on the end there, even with a three mil bead on the end, two and a half mil on the dropper, it still sinks. It's really important that that adjustable section can sink. You don't want to go too thick on here 
This is one of the reasons why I fell out of love with the wall or fluff indicator systems, the strikeout indicator system. Is you, I found it slipped. If you rigged it on thin line, I found it slipped, which meant you had to rig it on slightly thicker line. The problem with thicker line is it cuts through the water more slowly. It's more buoyant. It's got more surface area. So actually, I was making casts, and you know, after five, six, seven seconds on the water, the foot of line nearest to the fluff still hadn't sunk, which meant I wasn't in direct contact. With this, it all sinks pretty bloody quickly. You're in direct contact. And because the indicator can move, can swivel, can rotate, it always sits just right. There's no great kink or angle to this. It's always in a straight line. It's incredibly sensitive. You can see that it, it, it can kind of twist around its around its axis. So it's incredibly sensitive and it's always fishing in a dead straight line. See with that New Zealand system, you've got that kink of line that keeps everything in place. Eventually it, it marks the line, it kinks the line permanently. Whereas with this, there is none of that. It's all dead straight, it all sinks properly. It just works. It works in a better way than any other indicate system I've found. So that is system one with the little foam indicators. I don't think I've seen a better use of these foam indicators. And obviously they are massively buoyant, but hugely sensitive. They're not single use anymore. All of a sudden that'll last you as long as you could ever need to. This foam just goes and goes and goes. So you're not gonna have to use a load of indicators. You can see I've been using this system now for two years and that's how many I've been through. And I'll be honest, most of those I've been through showing people how to do this or doing demos or giving some of them away. Uh, one thing that it did take me way too long to notice is you actually get two sizes of indicator on here. And I hadn't noticed that for about a year. <laughs> so I was matching one with the other. And then I'd be like, oh man, I've done a real bad job at that. Like, it's not matched up. They're not straight, but actually they're just totally different sizes. And again, that gives you an extra addition of, of adjustability in terms of size. If you were fishing very lightning, so you could just use two of the smaller ones pinched onto each other. If you're using super heavy ones, you can use four of the big ones pinched together like I have done. So massively versatile loads of different options. You don't need to have two rods rigged up. It's a little bit bougie. I'll be honest, it's more for guiding than anything. So I haven't got to constantly keep changing rigs. Really adjustable system. Hopefully you guys get something out of this system. As I say, it's not going to be for everyone. But for those of you who are standing, flogging in the middle of winter, not wanting to use the European style techniques or finding areas where it's not appropriate, there you go. There's a rig for you. And actually, we'll get onto the European style techniques now. I found that the one area where the French style is less effective is in deeper, slower water, which is where that indicator system really comes in handy. The European style techniques are great for where there's a little bit of movement on the water, but I actually personally found that in slower, deeper water, it's harder work. It is doable. You have to kind of lead it through a bit, a couple of little induces and stuff like that, but it's definitely much harder work. Whereas that indicator system, you can get it out, let it sit on the water. It will trundle through at its own pace. Because of that, I tend to use slightly more mobile flies on that indicator system. So stuff with a nice flowy CDC hackle, particularly, I would just like that little touch of movement. That CDC just moves slightly, or at the very least gives the impression of movement. To be honest though, generally in the faster water, I'd be using my European style technique, which in truth, again, hasn't changed a whole lot from the last vlog we did about rigging stuff for the trout season. It's still a 10 foot two weight. I'm still using either a 10 or a 15 meter French leader. I much prefer these to the uh, French leader fly lines. I haven't found a huge amount of benefits to those, to be honest. They don't shoot as well. They sag more, there's more weight. They're really bloody expensive. I, I don't understand why they're so popular. I just don't get it. Perhaps a bit in terms of handling a little bit, but in truth, unless you're fishing a competition that requires you to have one of those French leader fly lines or the Euronym fly lines, I really don't understand why you'd go for it. So on here, we've got about 150 meters of vacuum. There's a 15 meter French leader on there, all loaded onto a cage spool reel so that leader can't get underneath the back of the spool. It's really frustrating. As I say, 10 foot two weight, and we'll go straight towards the business end down here to the indicator. Now I know what indicator's on here at the moment. This is one of the full in mill tactical sighters. So I've been playing with these for a few months actually. And in terms of guiding, I've got on really well with them. They are without doubt the most visible indicator I've found. And I find with people who are doing this for the first time, who aren't massively experienced with these styles, one of the biggest problems can be just seeing the bloody thing. So actually that's very, very visible. I must admit from my own fishing, I tend not to use these as much. I, I, I quite like using them in the vlogs because you guys can see them. And I like you guys to be able to see the indicator stop when we strike. But if I'm just fishing on my own, I'm still tending to just use the waxes and just paint these on. They're absolutely brilliant, super adjustable, really, really clever idea. All you do is draw this on. It's a bit like a lipstick. You draw it onto your French leader, two or three colors, 
uh, makes it easier to see. If you move to a different spot and it's a bit deeper, you rub that indicator out and you just draw another one further up the line. The reason I don't use them for guiding is because they are definitely less visible than something like this, than a solid indicator. So in terms of guiding, that's what I like to use. IB has really got on well with this stuff, Hanak Tricolor. She's been using this a lot. Exactly as it says on the tin, there's a bit of pink, there's a little section of black, there's a section of yellow, another section of black. And what she's been doing is cutting off a section of about a metre and then cutting that into thirds and knotting it together so there's lots of little tags. And she's found that really, really visible. You can't see it in the vlogs. <laughs> but she's found that really, really visible, good in most lights. Obviously at this time of year, we're gonna get lots of flat light, lots of difficult light. In terms of guiding, I'm definitely gonna be sticking to that Fuller Mill Tactical Sighter just, just because of the visibility of it. I know it's not sensitive, but it's more visible. Tip it ring on each end, nice and easy to rig. Down from there, again, this section from your indicator to your top dropper, for me is dictated by what you're expecting to be the deepest part of the river you're expecting to fish during the course of the day. Now I can see from this that this is set very shallow. I know where this was fished last time we were fishing in low water conditions. So this is, at the moment is only set to about five feet, four or five feet, not a huge amount. If you were fishing the Welsh Dee in big water, it would be much more than that. If you were fishing a, a moderate sized river, perhaps three or four feet deep, it would be about that. So the section from your indicator to your top dropper you don't want to have to change that all day. So set that to about the deepest part of the river you're expecting to fish during the course of the day. Onto there is the first tippet ring. 30 centimetres down from there is another tippet ring. Each of those has a dropper hanging down from it. The droppers, I must admit, I'm starting to get a little bit shorter with my droppers these days. I used to go to about five inches. I'm, I'm, I'm between kind of three and four inches now at the absolute most, particularly for grayling. And then there's probably another 25 centimetres down to the point fly. So if I hold that there, you can see from there to there, is about 55 centimetres and there are three flies in there. So you've got a point fly down there, two droppers, the whole thing is going to be within kind of 18 inches, two feet of the riverbed. If you're in a situation where that's too much, where you don't want three flies, all I do is nip off the middle dropper and just tie a slightly longer dropper on the top dropper. And then you've got a system where you can just fish two flies. So if it's skinny water, clear water, if you approach a situation where you think, I just don't want that third fly, it's going to be too much. You don't have to fish it. So actually this all of a sudden becomes very versatile. You can fish this as a two fly rig. I don't worry about the tippet rings being there. I don't think they're disrupting anything. I don't think they're putting anything off. But this is very easy to interchange from a three fly kind of Czech style to a two fly Spanish stroke, French style, whatever you want to call it. It's just, again, interchangeable. Those measurements make it really adjustable, really interchangeable. And it means that you haven't got to carry a two fly rig and a flea, and a flea, flea fly flig. Yeah, you know what I mean. In terms of diameters here, everything that's touching a fly is 7x. Everything that's not touching a fly is 6x, which means that if you get snagged up and have to pull for a break, the likelihood is you're only going to lose one of your flies rather than losing the whole rig. That drives me bonkers having to re-rig a whole thing. So in truth, that one hasn't changed a whole lot. In terms of flies, I'm not going to talk too much about fly side being. I've got a really exciting project coming up super soon. In fact, that there might be a little hint, as will this little trailer I'm going to roll now. So yeah, super exciting stuff coming up. We're really looking forward to all the plans we've got going forward. Guys, let me know what you think of the systems in the comment section below. Uh, speaking of below, you'll find links to all the products that you've seen in here, or as many links as I can find, in the description box below. They are all affiliate links. Remember, anything you buy out of these affiliate links, we get a tiny little cut out of it. It doesn't cost you guys anything. It just means that Amazon and eBay get a little bit less on their bottom line from the sale, which we really like. I know that particularly the indicator rig is controversial. A lot of people don't really like it. A lot of people absolutely swear by it, and that is absolutely fine, but let's not turn the comment section into a slanging match, there's absolutely no need. It's a legitimate technique, it's used worldwide. Mine is a little bit different, but it really works. I've got so much confidence in this rig and I just know that if you guys can go out and copy it, make it work for yourselves, you'll have confidence in it too. So please do let me know if you give it a go. We will be going out and fishing these rigs very, very soon, as soon as it stops raining, which feels like never at the moment, <laughs> but as soon as it does stop raining, we'll go out. 
we'll show you the rigs, we'll show them in use, and hopefully it'll be something that going forward you guys can try as well. But until then, I just need to say thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate it. Let us know what you thought. Let us know if you're going to try the rigs. Let us know if you have tried the rigs. And I, and I will see you again very soon for some more fishing and stuff. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.